Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions this morning during the presentations, you can type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, April 21st edition of Crop Talk. And uh, things have changed a little bit since uh, since last week. Uh, we've uh, gotten some snow, we've gotten some cooler temperatures, and I think it's uh, got everybody back into the yards and maybe not as uh, anxious to be out uh, scratching around and maybe planting some crops, So, uh, which in the uh, long run is probably not a bad thing. It uh, gives us some more time for that soil to get ready to go for plant spring planting and maybe not taking as many risks of uh, planting crop uh, too early. So uh, with that, uh, we've been out looking in some fields and uh, trying to see what things have overwintered. And I thought it'd be a good idea to uh, get uh, Kim Brown Livingston to come on today, our weed specialist. and talk about some of the overwintered weeds, uh, some of the things we're going to have to deal with uh, as we get uh, into spring seeding here. And so Kim's going to go through, uh, uh, I guess, a host of weeds and what we should be looking at. And then after that, our crop scouting panel, where we've uh, been getting some questions coming in again, which is great. And we'll try to answer those questions for, uh, for the people uh, as we go through. So with that, uh, let's turn the presentation over to Kim and let's get started on our overwinter weeds. Okay, are we good to go? You can see my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Lionel and Lori, for um, asking me and getting this organized and thanks everybody for listening today. Um, I hope we're off to a good start on our spring seeding and uh, I've been out in a few fields, haven't done, haven't seen a lot of things growing yet, although I have seen some lovely batches of stinkweed going. Um, <clears throat> it's getting big already, but it does, it tends to do that. It flowers super early. So um, with the dry weather and, and the recent cold, haven't seen a lot of weeds growing yet, but I thought we'd just do a bit of a review on some of the different weed types. Um, most of the ones we go after, obviously, are, are annual weeds. Those are the ones that come up. Uh, you know, this spring or come up this season and die and set seed and die this season. But these are weeds that um, that have different life cycles than our annual weeds. So, um, so winter annuals, they germinate when temperatures are cool. So they usually, they can start in late summer or early fall and they will continue to germinate up until freeze up. So they'll, sometimes they get quite big before freeze up and sometimes they're still little but they do start germinating basically any time after harvest they'll start to germinate so they can be all sizes going into the winter and depending on how they survive some of them are very very hardy and they survive really well um, other ones not so much if they're too big going into the winter they don't tend to survive as a winter annual and mother nature will take care of them for us so again, they can be all sizes by winter time. And then again, come springtime, they can be all sizes when they get growing and they get going very early. So they can get going early. Like I said, the only weed growth I've really seen a lot of this year so far is stinkweed. And it's really big already, really green, really doing well, despite the crazy weather we've had, the ups and downs in temperature, um, you know, the ups and downs in moisture. Some places in the province are still very, very dry. Um, but we have had, uh, most of us have had a little bit of precipitation in the form of snow recently. Um, but a lot of weeds just really aren't up and going yet, except some things like our winter uh, stinkweed, which is a winter annual and I'll get to that in a minute. So um, the winter annuals can be controlled in the fall or in the spring. Um, if they're big enough in the fall and if you're doing a fall spray program or if there's a fall tillage going on, again, that may not have happened last year just because of uh, the dry conditions, but the, it kind of, uh, it's hit and miss all over the province. Some guys got a good fall spray in, some guys got um, some tillage, um, some guys didn't do anything. So we're kind of all over the board as to what got done last fall for weed control. So really what you're looking at this spring, a lot of it has to do with what you did last fall. If nothing was done after harvest just because of moisture, you didn't want to disturb the soil, you didn't want to, sp didn't spray anything, there may not have been a lot growing last year and you might not have thought it was worth spraying, then um, you know that'll that'll dictate what's coming up first thing this spring. If you did manage to get some tillage in or some fall spraying done, um, then we hopefully would see uh, a reduced 
bunch of weeds uh, in our fields first thing this fall, or first thing this spring, sorry. But anyways, uh, if you're controlling in the spring, early is better because these things can get really big really quick. They're coming from an established root system. They're already big, they're already growing, and uh, lots of times they get out of stage or they get really, really hard to control uh, by the time we're ready to spray our in-crop uh, weeds. That's just too late by then, and, and they just tend to get ahead of us in those cases. So some of the winter annuals that we deal with on a regular basis are things like your narrow leaf toxbeard, um, your flixweed, they're all broadleaf weeds, um, your uh, stinkweed, of course, I've talked about that already, your shepherd's purse, those lots of members of the mustard family, volunteer canola, which can overwinter. And we see those ones, they kind of come up in the spring and they're really hard to get in the spring. They're kind of hardened off and they're kind of purpley colored. And uh, yeah, some of those guys will make it through the winter. There's another bunch of winter annuals called your chickweed or called your tender uh, winter annuals. And that's your chickweed and your cleavers and your storks bill. Um, they tend not to survive if the winters have been really harsh. So if we don't get a lot of snow cover and it gets, you know, we get some really, really cold temperatures, which we always get those, we just don't always get the temperature or so we don't, don't always get the snow cover. Um, or if they get too big going into the winter, they tend not to survive as a winter annual. So uh, with thing and things with winter annuals, most of these behave as an annual as well. So they're either coming up in the fall or in the spring or both. So lots of times you'll have all different weed stages of this same weed in your field. I find that's good sometimes if I'm trying to identify things. Um, because sometimes you can look at these and and if there's a bigger version of it it's a little easier for identification if you're not sure quite what it is so uh, when you're looking in the field just take a look around and i find uh the undisturbed areas so the edges of the fields um up against the tree rows um up against the bush if you've got any um sometimes right at the approach uh that type of thing kind of just you know coming in off the ditches uh, those are good places to look for some of the bigger weeds that would have survived over winter because they might have got missed with a spray or might got missed with tillage last year so those are good places to kind of keep to kind of see what could be in the field if you've got some smaller ones that you're not sure of and another one that I've got uh, is Canada fleabane and <clears throat> it's not a problem yet I should have said not a problem yet just not yet we do have Canada fleabane I've kind of been keeping an eye on it for quite a while. Uh, I've seen it lots in the Carmen area in ditches, kind of it gets up into the tree line. It doesn't go in very far, but see it lots in the ditches. Um, I've seen it kind of all over the province. It tends to be more of a nuisance weed. I've seen it in gardens and in flower beds. It really does not seem to be uh, a field weed yet and I'm really hoping it doesn't get there uh, but if you do a google search on Canada fleabane and you see the problems they're having with it in southern Ontario in their soybean fields uh, it's a real problem because of the glyphosate resistance and uh, it's got multiple group resistance glyphosate is the biggest one um, and this is a real problem and it's uh, a really aggressive weed once it gets there and because it is um, coming as a winter annual they're actually having a, a problem with it too in their winter cereal crops as well just because it's already uh, it's overwintering it's basically the same life cycle as something like a winter wheat uh, so anyways not a problem yet I'll show you some pictures of it just keep an eye on it we know it's out there it's growing here it just has not become a field weed yet and uh, I hope it stays that way so here's some narrow leaf talk spirit and I'll show you first a seedling and then I'll show you uh, um, this is the cotyledon shape here this this black and white photo here so when you're trying to identify weeds from seedlings you really the cotyledon shape on a broadleaf weed is really an important um, thing to look at because whether or not there's much of a stalk this one has kind of this oval cotyledon shape and really not much of a stalk down here so that's good to know um, your narrow leaf talk spirit um, it when they're this small, and I, I apologize, this isn't the greatest picture, um, but I plan on getting more pictures myself this summer that I can use and uh, have my own database of pictures. Anyways, um, it it looks it starts out small like a rosette. There could be a lot of different weeds at this stage, um, but when it gets a little bit bigger, um, it gets a little bit easier. It it can look like a dandelion. It's got a very very deeply lobed. Um, deeply lobed leaf you can see where my pointer is here um, it's a little different than dandelion to me dandelion the lobes are kind of more backward pointing they point down more towards the center of the plant and one thing that I, I really notice about um, narrow leaf talk spear the the bottom 
part will look very much like dandelion. So you'll get a rosette down here and you'll get, you know, these big rosettes and they have these big lobed leaves. And then once it starts to bolt and get a little bit taller, the leaves get very linear, almost like a grass. Uh, it's not a grass, but um, the leaves do get very linear and will have almost no lobes on them. And they really do tend to go straight up even the new leaves will go will be pointing almost straight up like the stem does so when you're looking at it in this stage and if you're looking at it and wondering whether that's a dandelion or a narrow leaf tox beard i find these newest leaves in the middle they tend to stand almost vertical and that to me is a really good way to identify it and then as it bolts of course to it it, um, it looks a little bit different than a dandelion you can tell them apart they're the same family so they are hard to tell apart um, but there's a few things to 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 look at and this is one that's really become a problem or it's a problem in reduced tillage systems and things and and once it gets in it's pretty tough to get so this is one that if you know you've got this on the farm uh, this is one I'd really be trying to get in the fall. Uh, you're not going to be able to use tillage to do anything about this. Um, some of your products, any product with tribenuron in it, that usually is uh, do a good job of cleaning this up. You need to look at some different products. Um, a lot of your spring products uh, that you'd normally use in crop, they really don't do much and um, they don't do a lot for a narrow leaf talk spirit. And part of the problem is by the time you get in crop, it's just too big. Um, but you need to look at using some pre products and, and some of the products that have some different chemistries in them to go after this weed um, that'll do a better job on it. But again, in the reduced tillage systems, and even if you're not in uh, technically in a min till situation, we just with the dry conditions in the last few years, people have been cutting down on the number of tillage operations they do just to conserve moisture. So just be aware that some of these weeds uh, will start to move in. They adapt very quickly to changes. And this is one that does really well once tillage um, are, are, you know, are the, the amount of times we're in there tilling, uh, once we start decreasing that, this weed starts to show up a lot more. So just really, really watch this one. Uh, flixweed, this is a weed, um, very finely divided leaf. This is a smallish one. Um, it can get really big really quick. It covers the ground pretty quickly. Um, kind of gray green, very soft feeling almost, very hairy, really, really hairy. Kind of long, long stalks on these true leaves and you can see these groups of leaves here. Um, and again, it's in, it's in this one, uh, sorry, this is this cotyledon shape in, in this case is kind of a, still oval here but has a much longer stock on it so again looking at these weeds when they're really small again we're talking about them today as winter annuals but they behave as annuals too so when you're identifying and to know what you're dealing with um, then you need to know it's a good idea to to look for them when they're really small uh, lots of weeds are easy to identify when they're really big once they get big and especially once they get a seed head once they get flowers on them and then a seed head uh, lots of times we know exactly what they are and by then of course it's far too late but if we can be identifying them when they're in the small stage so identifying them in the fall when they're looking like this again we may see some of these in the spring as well although we will have some overwintered ones and your overwintered ones uh, can be look like this and this is another one it's almost as bad as a stinkweed this thing can get really really big really really quick and when it's getting to be big like this um, it's really tough to control weeds like this they have an established root system the the carbohydrates are coming up from the root system to to you know to grow new plant material uh, these are just tougher to get once they start to get big and you can see in this picture we've basically got bare black ground behind it so um, you know by the time you've got to do something about this before uh, you get in here because uh, this is just going to be way, way too big by the time you're trying to get, there's just no way to get that with an in-crop herbicide. So these are things if you know, if you know you've got them and you may be able to just do some spot spraying or some edge spraying. And sometimes we see these just around the edges of the field or, um, you know, just, just, it may not be the whole field over again. This is another one that does like the reduced tillage system. So our zero till guys or our min till guys see this one starting to creep in, uh, seems to do well in the drier uh, end of, and the drier periods too. So this is one to keep an eye out for um, in with, given the climate and the weather that we've had in the last few years. Now here's our friend stinkweed. <laughs> I think we all know this one. Um, this one, the cotyledons on this one, they're more spoon shaped. So they're a bit rounder. They do have a bit of a, a stem here too. So like the handle on a spoon, so they can be quite round or they can be a little bit more oblong like this. Um, again, here we are, here's our cotyledons here. And then here's our first true leaves coming right here. Uh, it grows as a rosette. 
and it tends to be bright green. We know this one by the odor. When you crush it, it's got a very sour odor, um, very, um, very smelly. Uh, it's a problem if it gets into hay fields and, and it can contaminate, um, you know, uh, milk and things like that. It, it's got an off flavor. Uh, can put an off flavor and so we have to watch that in some of our hay fields and that type of thing for our dairy cattle uh, but again as a field weed we do we will see this along the edges of the fields it will go we'll see this again in our reduced tillage or our zero till fields we tend to see this one come up and you've seen we've all seen this and I'm sure it flowers very very early we'll see this stuff starting to flower super early and it gets very big very quickly and just absolutely covers the ground so you'll just get a mass of this stuff and again we've got just black soil here in the background nothing at all growing um, and yet our stinkweed is doing really really well and it'll be starting to flower there pretty quickly so um, again I've seen stinkweed out now for a few weeks and it's and just just lately it's really taking off so it's getting big so our burn off I, I know in with early springs it's really tough to get in there and do a burn off but uh, you've really got to watch some of these weeds they are just far too big and especially in a really dry year like this they're taking not only nutrients they always take nutrients but they're taking really valuable water and I know we've had a bit of moisture it's better than not having anything but we probably I know we still are nowhere near the amount of moisture we would like to see and so again all of your weeds in a dry year it's really critical to get your weeds gone early because they are taking uh, moisture that we need to get that crop germinated and get it growing and that type of thing so really important to get the weeds out of here as quick as you can uh, shepherd's purse here's another one here's a picture of it our cotyledons here are a little bit uh, this is uh, one here I think it's a little bit chopped off sorry um, and again a, more of a spoon shaped cotyledon again so that can be kind of more oval or maybe really really round a little, but more of a stem on it this way too and again it gets to be um, a real uh, we have a rosette here it can be very very hairy and then all of a sudden you'll get it starting to bolt and you'll get this long stalk coming up and then you'll start to see some flowering these things can get really big um, really big really quickly and uh, and again something again we've got black soil here in the background and not a thing growing elsewhere and yet this thing is probably the size of a dinner plate so again watch these weeds know what they look like when they're small get them out of there quickly um, and and conserve moisture and get that crop off to a good start um, i've included some pictures here on um on uh, like our chickweed, our cleavers, and our storks bill. I don't have a lot of pictures. I just have this one slide to show you. Uh, they we, they can behave as winter annuals. Again, I said they're the tender ones. They uh, they they mostly act as winter annuals. These two chickweed and cleavers do tend to they thrive in a really moist soil. They'll still grow in dry soils. Uh, everything will grow um, when it's dry, but they do they grow better when it's moist. And especially chickweed likes it when it's shaded. Um, cleavers does really well in certain certain areas of the province. We see a lot of that up north. Um, this has opposite leaves and like a little bit of a, a notch right here, a little bit of a point right here at the tip. Um, the cleavers starts, it's a whirl. They're quite hairy. They've got downward pointing hairs. They're like uh, very, very sticky. So anybody who's who's um, been in a field and come out of it wearing some wearing some cleavers <laughs> um, you know what that means what that feels like I just usually grab it from the top and I run my hands up the plant and if it just sticks to my hands it's it's very easy there'll be a little spiny tip here uh, at the end of the leaves here as well but these ones come in a whirl so there's just a few starting here when it's small but when it gets bigger it usually has like about six to eight um, in uh, whirls so there'll be a segment of a stem and then there'll be a whirl of leaves and then there'll be a segment of a stem whereas something like a chickweed has opposite leaves so you have two leaves coming this way and then you have your stem segment and then your next two leaves run this way and then they alternate up going in opposite directions there'll be uh, There'll be paired leaves, um, opposite leaves, and they'll alternate like that going up and down the stem. So most leaves, most weeds um, have alternate leaves, which means there's not really a pattern to them. So when you do see a weed that has a pattern like this, like a, like a whorl, or like opposite leaves as those are easy easier to identify and to put them at least put them into families um, certain families have opposite leaves um, something like the pink family for your chickweed and then and also the mint family like something like a hemp nettle if you can think of what a hemp nettle looks like it has opposite leaves and more like a 
um, a square stem as well. So those are things to keep in mind. Most of our weeds don't have those kind of leaves. So if you see a weed like that, and even when they're little, you can pull it apart and you can take a look at it and you can see the leaf arrangement. And that will help you uh, at least put it into a family and help you identify and narrow it down. Um, this is a bigger picture of Stork's Bill. It's got a very finely divided leaf. It has kind of a bright flower. And then it's got, if anybody has geranium plants around in the garden or you know, in the flower beds uh, when it warms up and stuff. Um, it has a, a seed head that looks very much like a geranium flower. It's got a long uh, pointy beak on it type thing. This uh, is not necessarily a really widespread weed, but where it has a, a presence, it really gets a toehold in and it's really, really tough to get out of there. And it can be a winter annual. We see it, I've seen it more like behaving like an annual, um, but again, it can get in there. And this is a product that a lot of, uh, oh, sorry, this is a weed that a lot of products uh, uh, don't do a great job on, uh, but anything with 2,4-D in it does a really good job on stork spill. MCPA doesn't seem to touch this thing, but anything with, uh, throw some 2,4-D in and that, that'll that help clean up your stork spill. Um, seems to come back though, it, it's, it's once it's there, it's kind of hard to get rid of, but um, it's just something to really keep an eye on. It really can form just a mat. It feels like you're walking on a really soft carpet when you get into a, a patch of this stuff. And again, a year like this, that's taking a lot of uh, water, a lot of uh, moisture away from our crop, and we can't afford that this year. So um, now Canada fleabane. Uh, this is one, I'll show you some pictures. Again, not a, not a weed of concern here yet. I just want us to be aware of it. When it starts out, I don't have a picture of the cotyledons, but they're here, um, this kind of the stalk and then a spoon. The first leaves have kind of these, just a couple of little notches on them. So this is a weed that goes through a bunch of different life transformations. I think it's, uh, it's really a chameleon. It looks like a lot of different things. I've seen a lot of it in this stage where it almost looks like a almost looks like a hairy stinkweed. It's got hairs on it, so that's a distinguishing characteristic. It's very soft, they're not prickly hairs, they're quite soft. And it can be quite roundish leaves and rounded lobes. And then, I don't know, somehow it ends up turning into something like this, which has actually quite a long, narrow leaf. And there's little little notches in the leaves that, that's not really lobed, but there's a little bit, especially towards this top third, you'll see them. And then when it's a full grown plant, it looks like this. These leaves tend to droop downward. Um, and you've got, um, it's kind of a tall, skinny plant. All these leaves kind of droop downward. It's hairy. That's very good distinguishing characteristic gets quite tall and thin looking and all of your uh, flowers are up here it's kind of like a dandelion type flower it's a white flower but then it's got it has fluff um, like dandelion fluff um, and this is a real problem in places uh, other than here and uh, I hope it stays that way so anyways just keep an eye on this thing and just know what it is and just watch for it moving into the fields Okay, so our biennials, we don't have a lot of biennials and really um, uh, not that not that they, not a lot of wheat crop problems coming from these, um, but biennial wormwood is one and it's not really, it's got a lot of natural tolerance to herbicide products. So it's harder to get rid of in certain fields, especially once it gets into some of our, like our dry bean fields or, or even our soybean fields, because it seems to have a pretty good tolerance to the group two, the ALS herbicides. It just really, they don't do a good job on it. So um, biennial wormwood, um, the, the cotyledon is here, uh, kind of long and oval, very little, not very much stock to it. And then the first true leaves on this one have these little notches right here. The first two leaves be notched like that. And then after that, it starts to look much more divided. Um, and it ends up looking like this. And what I've shown you here is actually uh, some pictures out of a North Dakota fact sheet that's very good. They've been dealing with biennial wormwood down in down there for quite a while. And it, it is quite a crop pest down there. It's a biennial weed, but it actually tends to act more like an annual. And because of that, it actually germinates a little bit later than the other annuals do. And it seems to start showing up in fields later on in the season. So you'll, you may not notice it early on when you actually when you're doing your spraying. Uh, but this is it next to uh, common ragweed. And if you have them side by side, the biennial wormwood is usually quite a bit more pointy tipped. I guess that's not really very 
um, scientific terminology, but they're very pointy, whereas um, uh, common ragweed is quite round, and common ragweed is, is quite hairy, and biennial wormwood is not. And it can be kind of more of a darker green color, and I find there's a quite a distinctive odor to it as well, um, versus ragweed it has its own odor, but those are things that you just kind of get to know over time. I've seen quite a bit of biennial wormwood, um, mostly seen it as a ditch weed, and again, it does pop up every once in a while in, in fields, uh, but we seem to doesn't seem to be as big of an issue here as it is down down south. Um, burdock, again, just to show you some of the biennial weeds, and these do can show up in crops as well. Um, here's your cotyledons, kind of long and narrow, and uh, not much of a stalk, and then the leaves start to get really big on this thing. And this thing, of course, this thing can get big. This is uh, not in a field, obviously, but this is just to show you the size of these things. They get very, very big, and then, of course, they have the big burrs um, that are... Uh, uh, the here they're at the top but they actually do come out all over the all over the plant and then they will drop their burr and uh, onto the ground and so you'll usually find big patches of these because the burrs just drop to the ground and then kind of germinate so unless they're getting moved around um, you'll find these germinating these things growing in kind of big patches so and our last one is nodding thistle this one can be in a crop again i'd be more much more concerned about this one in our minimum till fields or zero till fields um, most of our thistles are perennials but this is one that's a biennial and a lot of our thistles are really hard to tell apart when they're when you see them coming from a seedling um, the perennial thistles tend to come more from uh, uh, from creeping rootstocks, uh, but uh, they do they can come from seedlings as well. So you can see something like a Canada thistle or a perennial south thistle coming from seed, and they're really hard to tell apart. They kind of have this cotyledon that's kind of a a long oval cotyledon and then the first leaves they do have prickles on them they're not really prickly yet uh, they do get prickly a little bit later on and then we start to get this this starts to get very big very quickly and the prickles get bigger and meaner and then when you see the seed heads on these uh, this bottom part here where the bracts are there it's a little it's distinctive uh, the thistles tend to look the seed heads all look a little bit different on the thistles when you do when you do see them uh, but again this is a uh, this is a biennial, one of the biennial thistles, and most of them tend to be perennial. So with that, um, I have, I was, I do have slides on the perennials, or we could stop and we could go to the panel, or whatever you would like uh, to do, Lionel. Uh, maybe keep on going, uh, Kim. I think uh, you still got a bit of time. Okay. Okay, I don't have much. Um, sorry, oh, sorry. I guess there's my last picture of my nodding thistle there, and you can see this thing gets pretty big pretty quick. And this one obviously is in a in a, 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 a field that's obviously been tilled as well, so it can show up. But again, um, just watch for these these things. They get very big very very quickly. Um, they'll it'll be a lot. Uh, the individual plants can get very big very quickly. I find a little bit more so than like a perennial, like a Canada thistle type thing. These things get big, a big rosette, and then they start growing from there. So, okay, so our perennials, these are weeds obviously that live from year to year to year. They live more than one year. Um, dandelion, Canada thistle, perennial south thistle, quack grass, and foxtail barley. Um, foxtail barley is a bit of a different one. It's it's a short-lived perennial, so it doesn't it doesn't live forever. Um, and it's a funny one too. It's hard or harder to deal with because you've always got seedlings coming up in spring and you've kind of got all different age ranges of foxtail barley once it gets into a field or once you've got it in an area you'll have everything from seedlings to one-year-old plants to maybe three or four-year-old plants and they and you can kind of tell by the size of the the plant um because it's a bunch grass so you'll see how how big the bunches get the older it gets and and it's just it's a hard one because uh you can usually do a decent job on the spring seedlings when they're coming up um but but it's harder to control the bigger ones obviously so the perennials generally they grow best in the summer they need the heat of the summer to grow and that's when they're getting most of their growth in so normally we um, get our best control with a pre-harvest spray so if that's something that you've got on farm and I think that's a, a you know a big part of a lot of most farms is doing some pre-harvest spraying that's a really good time to take care of some of your perennial weeds um, trying to get in there post harvest usually there's not enough regrowth so if we came in right after post harvest you've got to give yourself enough time to let these regrow um, because you've cut the plants off and you have to have some more growth in order to take in the chemical um, the exception on this though is dandelion it grows really well in cool conditions and if you're trying to get in there with a pre-harvest spray a lot of the dandelions 
um, this year that are going to be next year's problems. They're down on the ground. They're not flowering. They're low on the ground. You tend not even to really notice them. Um, and our pre-harvest spray doesn't really do a great job of getting down there anyways. Um, so a pre-harvest spray on dandelion doesn't work great. Um, uh, Post-harvest control actually works best. And usually once you're getting into the fall and, and even all the way up until freeze up is really the best time to be controlling dandelion. So if you're starting to see that, and I think we've seen that everywhere, uh, you know, there's obviously a ban on urban spraying of dandelions and with the way that perennial uh, uh, set seed and, and the seeds fly around and stuff. So um, it's just kind of everywhere. So uh, we do, we are seeing this more and especially once, uh, you know, when you're reducing the amount of tillage operations on those fields, we do see the dandelion move in. And if you've got, it's in the ditches and any hay field and a lot of pastures, most pastures too, have some level of dandelion infestation in them now. So um, it's pretty tough to find uh, places where there isn't dandelion now. It's just everywhere. So um, again, so the, the and the, the reason that we get such good work, um, good control on uh, when we're going after these things with a pre-harvest or with a fall spray is that the carbohydrates are moving into the roots in the fall and the herbicide moves downward and you get good control. In the spring, these perennial weeds are coming from an established root system. Um, they've got lots of juice to get that plant going and the carbohydrates are moving up from the roots and the herbicides can do a decent enough job on new growth, but they really aren't going to kill that root system. And on a perennial plant, that's what you need to do is get that root system gone. You can kill the top growth all you want. It's going to keep coming back. Um, tillage, maybe, maybe not. Usually it would need to be aggressive in order to do something. And again, some of these root quite deeply, something it works a little bit better on something like um, like a foxtail barley because that's quite shallow rooted. And so tillage does work quite well on that perennial, but generally um, it would need to be very aggressive tillage. And especially on a year like this, that dries out the soil pretty badly. So I'd be very cautious doing that unless there's just no other choice. Um, here's our dandelion, our friend, the dandelion. Um, and again, when they're small, they've got a few different, uh, like the leaves have these different lobes on them. All diff le Dandelion leaves come in all different sizes and shapes. But when I'm trying to tell it apart from some other weeds in the rosette stage, I really find that dandelion has these backward pointing lobes, like right here, if you can see where my pointer is circling, those lobes just... Um, they, they kind of point down into more the center of the plant. You can see in, there's another good example of it right there. And again, these are quite soft kind of um, uh, wimpy leaves. They're not really hard like a lot of some of the other, like some of the thistles get a very stiff leaf, whereas the dandelion leaves are quite soft. Um, Canada thistle, I think we probably all know what that looks like. This is it coming up from a seedling. It can set from seed, but most of it um, comes from uh, an established root system. And you can see here, there's these underground horizontal roots. They run along the ground and all these Canada thistles are coming up um, in, coming up in this, um, off this horizontal root. And so there's just like a a network or a web of roots and underground. And so when you see this, these thistles, they'll be coming up in patches. And sometimes the biggest ones are in the middle. And then as you um, go out from the patch, you'll see lots of seedlings like this coming up. Uh, sorry, I lost my pointer there. Lots of seedlings like this coming up and you'll see they'll be on this long. If you pull them up, you'll get this long white stem and then, all, where, and then it'll attach to this underground root right here, right there. Our perennial south thistle, we've actually got three kinds of, of south thistle. There's, there's annual south thistle, there's spiny annual south thistle, which is a little bit different, and then there's perennial south thistle. So this is obviously the one that is um, the longest lived and, um, and the easiest way to tell it apart. Um, it tends to be uh, prickly, but not as prickly as a Canada thistle. The leaves are a bit softer, not as stiff feeling, and the prickles aren't usually quite as um, sharp and quite as hard on the hands. Um, this is it growing in a pot uh, at the old in the old weed garden um, at the U of M farm there. And so you can see the leaves sometimes there, they can be quite divided and they can be quite not divided, I guess. It, it's kind of a, a different, they, 
they, it looks quite different. It, it, it will not be as divided um, as a dandelion will, and it doesn't tend to have those backward pointing lobes on it. So when it's smaller, it could be confused with, there's a number of weeds that you could confuse it with, but the leaves tend to be quite soft, um, maybe not many lobes on the first leaves coming out, but then later on, it does start to look more like a thistle. And then of course, just you pull it up. If once you pull it up and you see um, this underground root system, then you know you've got a perennial. Um, if you're looking at, if it's a, an annual sow thistle, whether it's the annual or the spiny annual, they have quite a big tap root. So you can see when you pull it out and it obviously is not attached to a root here, but these roots are quite thin, actually the same as Canada thistle. This is kind of a thin little root. So you'll notice that when you pull it up. Quack grass, uh, this is our only uh, grass that I'm talking about, or uh, the, uh, the perennial grasses is, uh, the, there's quack grass and then there's the foxtail barley. Um, the we, again underground root system if you it actually looks fairly similar to wheat if you're looking at it it's got oracles and um type thing and so but it will be growing in a patch it'll be up very early um kind of all different it won't obviously be in a row so when you're seeing something um coming up in a field and you're seeing this grass coming up but it's coming up in between the rows it's kind of coming up with no pattern to it uh, but it can look like wheat but always always pull it up whenever you're looking at grasses pull them up um, wild oats will almost always have a, an old the, the seed attached to it and quack grass will always have this so you'll have this root system come down but you'll have all these other roots coming out and there'll be these brown scaly things on it and everywhere where there's a scale there can be another plant coming up so there's a node here and uh, this is just um, yeah just pulling you can pull these roots out forever they just they just go forever there's quite a big underground root system so again this one you know we've we've with our pre-harvest sprays and stuff this is uh, something that we've that's done a, we've not really got as much of a problem as we used to have in the early days of zero till and min till when we didn't have a lot of products uh, to use and stuff this could really there could be huge quack grass patches but um, I think we've gotten a fairly good job at controlling this now and foxtail barley this is one um, again it's a bit of a different one it's a simple perennial so it pre reproduces only by seed so you're not going to have anything coming from the, the there's no underground root system so all of these fluffy fluffy seed heads um, that fly around and they're very light and they fly around and so they um, that's what's setting seed so you'll have everything from a tiny little seedling and then you'll have something like this which is maybe a, a, you know a younger perennial it's maybe a year or two old it's not very big and then you get these big clumps like this that this has been here this has been here for a while and it's short-lived though it doesn't live absolutely forever but it's hard when you're coming into a field situation when you're looking at this situation you've got everything from this to this to this and so we do see this um, it does well in say line soils it it when other plants don't do well so we do see this creeping in from the edge of the field where the salinity is an issue you'll see it around sloughs and that type of thing um, as we're because we're in a dry cycle we do see those salinity problems um, worse in the dry cycles because of um, capillary rise when the water is coming up from the subsoil to feed our crops it brings the salts back up to the surface with it so and really the only way to get rid of those salts is to get decent amounts of precipitation to basically push them back down deeper in the soil so in the dry cycles we see the salts coming more to a surface we see a problem with other you know uh, salinity loving weeds like kochia but this is definitely one that you'll see in the saline areas and you see all different stages of growth in it so it can be a little difficult to control so assure probably does it does about the best job of taking care of these seedlings and if you've got uh, a problem if you've got these big patches uh, the uh, using Olympus which is um, a pre uh, see a pre spray from Bayer uh, works really well but it's got to be followed up with a Vero or, or a Velocity in order to really do a good job but it does a really good job of taking this out in crops so there are a couple of different herbicides um, that do a decent job and again that's something to talk to your chem reps about and to see which is the right option if you've got this one coming in so I think that's all I had. If there's questions, I can take them or we can uh, move to the panel now. Okay, Kim. Uh, yeah, there's just a, a couple of questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. One question was um, uh, when you talked about burdock, uh, I guess what's the mm -hmm. best way to control burdock and, uh, and what would be, say, one of the products or a product that might be better to use on it? 
Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, Burdock is a tough one. Off the top of my head, I'm not. I, you know what, Lionel? I could actually go through and try to get a list together. There's not a lot of products. It's it's a tough one to get, and uh, I I don't know. Again, we do see it, especially like in in if you're looking at it in a pasture situation, then there's definitely like your pasture products will do a decent job on it. From, from a crop situation, there's not a lot, but I could get some a list together and kind of. It's a short list, but I can get that together for you. And then you can okay. distribute it if you like. You bet. Okay. And then um, maybe just a comment. I guess the question that came in is with the cool temperatures here, uh, what should I be looking at for uh, spraying uh, before seeding? Yeah, I'm a big fan of pre-burn um, and never glyphosate by itself. Always throw something in it. I know we don't have a lot of weeds growing. If, if honestly, if there's absolutely nothing, then I guess you don't need to spray. When you're looking at temperatures, though, um, we need to have obviously enough weed growth. If there's been a frost and we've had that the last few nights, um, you know, there's, you know, the, there's ice and the little bit of the puddles that are there. So you have to let your temperatures, you have to have, um, you have, your temperatures have to, um, uh, obviously you don't want to spray first thing right after a frost. You need to have active weed growth. So if we have get down to the point where we've got some really hard frost, you need to maybe wait a day or so. If the temperatures have just gone down not too cold, you would want to be giving yourself at least four or five hours for them to be in a good range. Normally you want your temperatures to be in that eight to ten degrees to be spraying and higher. If you wouldn't want to be spraying anything below that because you're just not going to get any plant growth that's going to take that up, even if the weeds are there. So I know with the weather we've had that's definitely slowed down our seeding i know there definitely has is a lot is some crop in the ground already um but if you do have time to spray um i i am a, a really big fan of of the pre-burn um just because we've got a lot of resistant weeds coming and just a chance to take that weed con or to keep those fields nice and clean before we get in there and it takes a lot of pressure off our in-crop sprays um, so it's just, but again, with the cool nights that we've been having, uh, it, I guess right now it's, it's more difficult to get that pre-spray on because it's, we don't, A, we don't have a lot of weed growth. It's been very dry and it's also been cold. And then also we're cut and then B, we're coming off some of these cold nights. So you need to definitely have the weeds actively growing in order to take up the chemistry that you're spraying on them. And, uh, you don't want to be spraying it again after a really cold frost and, trying to like again try to get to make sure that you've got a good period of the day in that eight to ten degree range and uh you'd want to uh and and that that's your best chance of success of some of these sprays working yeah and uh i agree with you there it's been probably eight out of ten times where if you haven't done your uh burn off that you land up later having issues in uh in crop spraying so uh, definitely be out there scouting even if you think there's no weeds make sure you go out there and take a good scout I agree with you there yeah it just it just takes the pressure off that in crop spray and um, and again we're the you know we're just we're really not struggling yet but but we know the resistance issue is getting worse and worse and I know Lionel you've been dealing with that for a long time down in the southwest there with the kosher and um, you know and that type of thing and it just um, it really does give our uh, it gives those in crop sprays a better chance to work it takes away some of the pressure and also then it takes away there also when you do get to that in crop spray you're dealing with small weeds uh, part of the problem is if you do skip that pre-spray for any reason and and you know it, it like i said this year if we get in the fields early and there isn't much growing it's it's it can be tough but if you get out and walk your field um there's a lot more growing there than you think sometimes and sometimes those weeds depending how aggressive your tillage system is those weeds if they're not disturbed or if they're if they're uh continue growing after you get you know you get seeding and your crop starts coming up by the time you get to an in-crop spray some of those weeds are really big and beyond staging and um and then then it's just then we see some some problems so i just encourage you even if you think there's nothing growing if you you know actually get down and walk there's a lot more green out there than you think it's just pretty small 
You bet. Okay, well, thanks, Kim. That was a good presentation on some of the weeds we're going to be dealing with uh, in the near future. So uh, thanks again for coming on today. And uh, we're going to head into the crop panel now. And uh, we have uh, a few questions that have come out uh, up this week are a couple of things. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about and I uh, talked to Ann Kirk about is wondering how our winter wheat and fall fall rye crop is doing. Uh, I've been in some of the fields myself and and they're definitely not looking as good as last year, at least in the fields I was in. So, uh, Ann, uh, or, uh, how are you feeling about these? Yeah, I haven't been to too many fields, but what I have seen, um, at least some of the crops I've seen have looked okay. And I've talked to um, some other agronomists around and in the Northwest region, I'd heard that crops looked fairly good. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty early also to tell. So it's like we did have, you know, to break dormancy, we need temperatures that are consistently above zero. So a couple of weeks ago, we were seeing those temperatures. And I think that some of those crops had broken dormancy and are starting to grow. But with the cool temperatures in the last week or so, we haven't really seen a lot of new growth in the winter wheat and fall rye. So in checking some fields around Carmen on Monday, I did notice that there is some new growth. Um, but I think that that growth has really stalled out over the past week. So, you know, in order to make sure your winter wheat and fall rye are actively growing, it's best to dig up some plants and rinse off the rinse off the roots, and then check to see if you see any new um, new root growth coming from the crown. So you would notice it because it's you know quite white and nice looking compared to um, those older roots from last year. And I do have a couple of pictures if it's okay to sure, share my screen. Laurie, if you could hand the screen over to Ann. Great. So this is just um, some pictures of fall rye from uh, that I took on Monday. So the fall, like the fall rye that I had seen then, was looking fairly good, and we did we're seeing some new growth. Um, this here, this is a picture from last year. So you can see that this winter wheat is is more advanced um, and it's actively growing. Um, but that white root on the bottom there is what we're really looking for. So that new fresh growth from the crown um, is what we should be looking for to make sure our, our wheat and fall rye are actively growing. And before there is a chance to actually check it in the field, um, this is probably the easiest method for people uh, is to uh, dig up some plants from the field, rinse the roots off, and then trim the roots um, one inch above and then right below the crown. So the, oh, sorry, my, the first picture I moved it and it's not actually pointing to the right spot anymore. But in picture two, you can see um, where uh, the nubby end on the right hand side is the crown. So all those roots below that have been cut off and uh, they cut off about an inch above the crown. And then putting that those fresh plants in a plastic bag with uh, some air puffed into it and then leaving it for say a period of four to seven days um every couple of days you know rinsing those roots off again and putting new air in the bag and then looking to see uh the new growth so all those red arrows on the bottom picture show new growth coming from those shoots and if you don't see any new growth after about a week then you could expect that that plant hasn't survived so yeah, if anyone else has experience in uh, winter wheat and fall rye crops and how they look in the province, I'd like to hear that as well. Yeah, um, one of the things that uh, I've been seeing uh, in some of the fields is uh, there's just some patchiness uh, right now. And uh, some of that might be due, I guess, to the fact that maybe those spots just haven't got going yet. But uh, um, some of these areas were areas that maybe didn't have uh, enough snow cover and we did get some of those areas that the wind blew up basically all the snow right off so just not 100 percent sure those ones have made it yet so doing a test like you showed would probably be a good thing yeah this year was really tough for snow cover like you know obviously we got really limited amounts of snowfall in many areas of the province so yeah i would, I would expect some patchiness just due to the uneven snow cover in fields Okay, hey, thanks, Anne. Uh, the next question, uh, I'm gonna maybe get uh, John Gavoski to talk about, and this is in case uh, we're looking at um, some uh, crops that might have to be resowed. Uh, there's always the question is, uh, what do I sow on those acres? And uh, one of the things we always run into is uh, wheat streak mosaic. So uh, 
John, if uh, you can maybe uh, address that for us. Sure. Uh, so Wheaton Streak Mosaic, it's a virus and it's vectored by a mite. So you can't control it with a fungicide because it's a virus and the mite, it's a wheat curl mite, it curls the leaves. So insecticides and uh, miticides don't work well against the mite. So the tricky part is how do you kill the mite and how do you prevent this from happening? And the way you do that is you starve the mites. So the mites really can't go too long without food, uh, only less than a day actually. But what we suggest you need to do is make sure you have the area where you're going to seed your cereal crop free of uh, volunteer cereals or grassy weeds for at least two weeks if possible. Uh, that way, again, your, your goal is to starve these little microscopic mites. So we call it breaking the green bridge. So if you've got a lot of volunteer cereals that have come up uh, or grassy weeds, you've got to get them out of there and break that green bridge, keep it uh, free of those grassy plants for ideally about two weeks, and then you've reduced the risk of wheat streak mosaic. Now, they are tiny mites. They can blow around on the wind, um, so it is possible for them to still move in, but at least you've done all you can to reduce the risk. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, our next question is uh, for Dane. Um, Looking at the canola prices, uh, and some producers have been talking about tightening up their rotations. Um, I guess the question is, what should they be aware of, and what should they be planning to do if they're looking at doing this, or is this a good idea at all? So, uh, Dane, if you're uh, there, can you take it away? It's very hard for me to sit here uh, and tell a farmer not to grow something that's profitable for them. Um, but as we know, crop prices have been going uh, nuts most of the winter already, and uh, they are set to be increasing again. I know canola hit limit up again the other day, and, and uh, another other, other crops are also coming up. Looking at tightening rotations and putting more canola in rotation this year makes me nervous. Um, from a perspective of disease, mostly, we were, we were in a very high black leg situation last year, and we're starting to see increased yield losses due to black leg starting to see other diseases that are soil borne um, become more, more aggressive uh, and, and spreading wider, particularly club root and verticillium stripe as we grow more and more canola, uh, especially in areas where those rotations are tight or resistant genetics aren't deployed and those other good agronomic and rotational crop management strategies aren't practiced. Putting canola on canola certainly increases the risk of black leg. Canola two years out from canola actually has the highest risk of black leg due to the, um, uh, oh boy, uh, the certain type of spores uh, becoming fully mature and starting to reinfect. I'll have David give me the exact name there. Okay, it's and the Paracetia, those uh, bigger black structures on the woody stems that produce ascospores, and uh, they're the ones that are most plentiful two years after your canola crop. They take about 18 months to mature. David, you cut off there at the very beginning. What is the name of that spore? Um, the name of the structure is parathesia or pseudoparathesia, and they eject ascospores, which can blow around in the wind. Okay, thank you. And um, when producers are considering growing more canola, uh, know that black leg fungicides early on in the season can help reduce infection, but it will not have an impact on yield. Those losses will still occur, but the severity of the infection and um, cross-section of the stem at the infection does appear to be less, but the yield losses don't appear to be improved or you're not protecting against yield loss according to recent research that was published. Also with tightened rotations, uh, your phosphorus fertility will be drawn down further and expensive phosphorus in the spring of 2021 might mean that now is not the time to uh, buy additional phosphorus if you haven't already pre-booked it, um, but perhaps budget for booking phosphorus this fall and for the 2022 crop. So everything I'm saying is, is if you're able to find an alternative 
crop instead of growing more canola lots of other crops are also looking really profitable right now wheat is coming up soybeans are up uh, corn is up if you're in those corn growing regions flax is also doing really really well that's a great alternative oil seed where the where it's not susceptible to a lot of those um, same diseases um, so do do recognize that there are other options out there that can be profitable it just takes a little bit more management and a little bit more time to do so so uh, uh, take take that as you will okay and maybe a further question to uh, you and David um, is uh, if uh, let's say I was planning on canola but now I'm going to think about soybeans is there any issues I need to worry about uh, with uh, say uh, soybeans on canola stubble not particularly no uh, soybeans on canola stubble do well. Uh, there is no reason to believe that there's any sort of yield penalty or yield drag by doing that. Um, they're not susceptible to the same suite of diseases, uh, sclerotinia being or white mold being the primary one, but soybeans are a lot less susceptible to uh, sclerotinia than canola or dry beans or, or other more sensitive crops are. And if we're faced with a dry season, sclerotinia isn't likely to be much of an issue anyway. So uh, that shouldn't be a concern, but but if it is going onto ground that hasn't had soybeans before, or it's been a number of years since soybeans were last grown, do make sure those soybeans are inoculated well, uh, perhaps even double inoculated if it's if it's burning ground and uh, that inoculum source isn't present in soil. It's uh, Dennis here. I just want to jump in on this question real quick. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, no real issues there. I just would always be concerned that uh, um, if you've, uh, you know, you don't want to be growing around the Brady Canal last year and, and moving into around the Brady Soybean this year, um, that could cause a lot of issues with weed control. So that's something to really keep in mind um, in there. And then if you do have volunteer canola uh, coming up uh, in the field, you got to really pay attention to that uh, through the season to make sure it doesn't overtake it. So, yeah, good point, Dennis. Thanks. Okay, and uh, David, uh, while we're still on this question, is there any, uh, everybody seems to be talking right now that dry conditions, is there any diseases that, we always seem to say that wet conditions bring on more disease, is there any issues with dry conditions and any any certain diseases? Well, of the fungi that cause root rots, I'd say that Barazectonia is the most likely to be a uh, potential in uh, dry conditions um, and that's on generally the broadleaf crops. Uh, when it comes to cereals I'd say common root rot is uh, most likely to occur in, in dry conditions um, as opposed to the water molds like Pythium and uh, Phytophthora on the, the broadleaf crops. But often in dry conditions uh, Soilborne diseases aren't a, a big issue, but um, you know if it's dry, when you seed, you can often get a deluge of moisture, and that changes the the conditions. And then uh, things like Pythium and Phytophthora can can be a concern. Okay, great, thanks, Dave. Um, Lionel, can I jump in? It's Kim. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just was checking my notes. I don't have a lot of notes on burdock, sorry. Um, just basically, you, you're pretty limited on products. Like I said, there's not a lot. Uh, 2,4-D and dicamba will do a good job. Um, it's actually listed, um, I think, your Aralex herbicide, which is in your Prominex. That's a Corteva product. Um, it's listed on that label, but it really better, uh, have a better shot when it's smaller, too. And basically, tillage, uh, it doesn't survive well with tillage. So if uh, that is an option at all. That's probably your number one way to get rid of it. But your product selection is fairly limited. Like I said, you're limited to just some of those group fours, and um, with and that's there's not a lot uh, in in a field situation. If you're looking in a pasture or a hayfield situation, there's a few more industrial products that are available. And we actually do have a table in our guide. The last table is the industrial crop table. Um, it's um, uh, new this year and it's not quite complete, so it'll have a few more products in it next year. But on page 76 of this year's crop guide is uh, the industrial vegetation products. And there's um, some products in there that uh, are listed for burdock as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Kim. 
Uh, next question. Uh, this question came in last week and it was just a little bit too late to uh, to get it on. So I uh, brought it up this week here and uh, I'm going to open up this one to the whole panel because I think uh, I think there's a few uh, answers that could come from a few different people here. But it's regarding sea treatments on old canola, sea treated with certain sea treatments. How long is a sea treatment good for? And should I worry about insecticide not being good after, let's say, two years? Maybe I'll jump in and, and uh, handle this, at least initially, Lionel, because I've actually talked to Syngenta and Bayer reps quite recently with that exact question, and I got pretty much the same answer from both of them. Um, they did say that if the seed has been stored in a dry place and germination is good, then the seed treatment effectiveness will be maintained. And uh, one of the companies mentioned that they, they've done tests and they um, expect that the, the uh, seed treatment to be effective for a minimum of 24 months, again, providing the storage conditions have been good and uh, the germ and vigor of the seed is good. So that's going to be the bigger factor is um, is the germination and vigor, has that been maintained? The seed treatment should still be effective. The, likely the germination and vigor will run out uh, before the seed treatment starts to deteriorate in any way. So the important thing is make sure the seed has been stored well and maybe do a germination test just to see that it's uh, still going to germinate well. Okay, a few years ago I remember um us talking about um, the, the uh, sea treatments having an effect on germination. Has anybody got a comment on that? Labels? No, yeah, it's, uh, it's Dennis here. Oh. oh, yeah, so it, it's Dennis here. I can make a couple comments just based on what I've seen before. Um, and again, the biggest thing is is how would that how that seed is stored, I guess is the first thing, is it stored in good conditions. A lot of times it's going to be stored in the back of the shed somewhere. So you really need to resample those if they're in, let's say, canola bags or, or if it's soybean seed in a tote, let's say. You really need to do a good sampling of that and then do a germ on it and just to see uh, how, well it's going to, how well it's going to work. Um, some years in the old, in, with dry beans, I've really never had a real major issue with uh, germination dropping off with seed treatments, but it was more on how dry the seed was. And in some years, if the seed was, was down to 10, 11%, then it wasn't stored right, the germination would fall off. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just making sure, just don't assume it's good, because I've, I've had experience where the, you know, uh, a tote of wheat seed that was treated the year before, uh, a couple of years before, was not germed and then we put it in the ground and, and nothing came up. So it's just really important to make sure that just don't assume, you know, everything's going to be good. Just do, even if you're doing an um, in-house germ, uh, bringing a, a seed sample in the house and putting it in under uh, uh, wet paper towels for a week and just see what kind of germination you have. So. Hey Dennis, um, I'd like to add in here specific to canola though. I think that's how the question was, was phrased. Um, Pulses are going to be a lot more sensitive than, say, an oil seed or a, or a cereal will, but obviously don't take it for granted. Um, Ag Canada has done some research that found that storage at a temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and less than 8% moisture when bagged and when going into storage for canola will have that certified seed tag. If, if say, it was sold as certified seed and it wasn't opened and it was just kept in the back of a shed at those conditions, that will maintain that 90% germination level for at least 20 months. However, if that seed was stored in a heated shop, anywhere where there's more cellular respiration, that cell or that seed is starting to use its own nutrients to keep itself alive while it's sitting under a 15 or 20 degree uh, back of a heated workshop, that seed is going to be a lot less vigorous and a lot less uh, germ than that seed that's stored in those ideal conditions. So that's keep in mind where your seed was stored. And then if you're really concerned, do, do that um, germ check. That's a good point, Dane, because uh, a lot of he, a lot of shops uh, in the summertime, uh, a lot of that seed gets uh, pretty hot in those shops. So I can see where we definitely need to be rechecking those. So uh, anybody else got any comments? Uh, Dave here. 
I don't know if uh, John mentioned it. I don't know if I was listening carefully enough, but a couple of the products you mentioned are um, insecticide only. And I really think that it is the insecticide component that's probably going to be important this year because flea beetles are going to be really hungry as the crop comes out of the ground. So you want to be sure that uh, it's there and uh, is still effective. A couple of these products that you mentioned are, um, of course, dual purpose and they have usually three different fungicides on them that are supposed to control the, the spectrum of fungi that attack uh, the crops. But the overriding concern, of course, is the, the germinability and the vigor of that seed. Okay, great, thanks Dave. Good, uh, going to, uh, I guess how, we're going to end the panel here for today. Uh, that was all the questions we had. Uh, and uh, just a few more slides here. Uh, I wanted to bring up this slide uh, regarding WADO, the West Bend Ag Diversification Center in uh, Melita is looking for uh, a one-year term diversification technician. So if anybody uh, knows of somebody looking for a job or if you're looking for a term position, uh, deadline is uh, approaching here. It's the end of the month. I think it's April the 30th. Uh, if you um, want in more information, uh, if you can uh, get a hold of Scott Chambers, he'll be the, the one. And uh, so uh, if you do know anybody, please uh, uh, let them know about the uh, the job. Uh, our we guide that was mentioned a couple times uh, in the presentation today, uh, available at all the MASC offices, and they're the offices that uh, you'd be able to pick up the uh, the books at, or uh, give a call to the uh, one eight four four number, and uh, that would uh, they'll get you in contact uh, with uh, who has books for you. So uh, um, that's the best way to uh, to get books for this year. Uh, our ag ad adaptation specialists uh, throughout the uh, um, province here, um, myself, uh, Terry Buss, Earl Bergen, Nicole Clausen, Mayor Farouk, Inga Christensen, and Rajon Picard. Uh, there's their locations, there's their phone numbers. Again, even if you're looking for a weed guide and can't uh, figure out which way to go to look for one, uh, give these people a call. Uh, we'll uh, do our best to get all the information for you. Uh, and if you've got questions or Anything happening in the field, uh, definitely give them a call. And uh, there's Lori Forbes information for the uh, certified crop advisors. Um, again, uh, join us next week, April the 28th. Uh, that'll be the next edition of Crop Talk. Thanks for everybody for joining uh -huh. and thanks for presenters in the panel. Oh, I sorry, know, go ahead. That's David here. Um, yep. Did uh, John Hurd get a chance to have his um, comment heard from the chat box? Uh, he had a comment about uh, dandelions. I did support. send I did send it out to all, um, okay. all the audience in a chat, so I yeah. assume yes. Okay. All right. Um, I heard that dandelions and forages are likely uh, like a soil test telling you that is John on maybe John can just uh, talk about that quickly before we uh, end the day here John are you there oh well well it, it, it's short and sweet that uh, you know a lot of forages in this province are malnourished and if we if we have dandelions invading them it's because uh, in many cases they've, they've just been starved for nutrients in particular phosphorus so when you see dandelions when you go to buy more alfalfa seed to replant uh, all also buy more phosphorus and keep those plants, uh, those fields properly nourished. Uh, that's all I'm saying about that. And, and there are other indicator weeds okay. too. Uh, Kim covered some of them and she'll cover more in future talks. I'm sure. Okay, so uh, that's a good one. So if you're seeing dandelions in the field, we're probably short of phosphate. Yeah, and uh, your weed specialist would 100% agree with that. If you have weedy fields, weedy hay fields, weedy pastures, um, 
a herbicide maybe is not the best place to be spending your money. Um, I'd invest in some fencing, do some high intensity grazing, and I would for sure get some fertility on there before I'd probably start spraying something. I think that's a better way to go. And I think definitely um, when you get weeds in there, that's an indication that there's something else going on, so. Okay, well, um, thanks and sorry, I almost missed you there, John. So thanks, David, for uh, showing me that. And uh, and uh, okay, well, that's uh, that's it for today. Thanks for everybody for joining and see you next week.